Hey, how you doing? Scotty from Scott's Bass Lessons, hope you're well. And this is the first episode of Ask Scott, and that's me. Um, so this is all about you guys being able to ask me questions. Normally in the SPL Academy, we do this bi-weekly, but we do it live for two hours where everybody asks me questions live. But because it's December and what we're doing in December is releasing a new video every day. So from the 1st of December right to the 25th Christmas day, we're going to be releasing a new video every day. What we thought would be a cool idea is to do kind of sort of like an Ask Scott show where you get to ask me whatever you want. So... If you're watching this, make sure you leave a comment or a question below in the comment boxes, um, and then we'll submit, um, submit, we'll pick 10 questions, okay, and then they will be answered for next week's show. Okay, so let's get on with the show and check these questions out. Mike asks, when did you want to play bass guitar and play jazz solo bass? Hey Mike, how you doing? So when did I decide I wanted to play bass? Um, I actually started playing bass really late in life. Well, not late in life, but um, c compared with some people quite late. Um, I started playing when I was around 18, 19 years old. And how I actually played guitar before I played bass. I played classical guitar when I was about... I started classical guitar when I was about 13 or 14. Um, and then started playing the electric guitar in rock bands and you know the thing. And then when I got to 18 and 19 years old, I started an apprenticeship working for Overwater Bases, funnily enough. And Chris May, who is the guy, the mastermind behind Overwater Bases, um, he was just really into a lot of jazz music, um, ranging from Weather Report to Brand X, if anybody can remember Brand X, Weather Report, Brand X, uh, UZEB with Elaine Karen on bass, you know, loads of fusion -y type jazz stuff. And it just really resonated with me. I was really into it. And then one day a guy came down to the workshop and he was having a bass built. And I can remember just standing there and I, and I just thought, well, I said out loud, I was like, oh, I wish I could play like that. I wish I, I could play bass like that. And Chris was standing next to me and he just said, well, you probably could. You should take a bass home. So I went home with the bass that night and the rest is history, as they say. Um, as far as solo, you know, playing um, solos on the bass, it's kind of just something I got into via jazz. I've also done some completely solo stuff where it's got some more like chordal arrangements for bass. And, and that was just, you know, maybe too many hours in the shed playing with my bass and just coming up with, you know, ways to uh, play bass on my own. And that was it, really. Thanks for asking the question, Mike. Stephen asks, Hey, Scott, a big thank you for all your lessons so far. You really have helped me unlock few, a new doors and move up a new level. You never touch on reading. Do you have any advice, tips to improve my sight reading? Would really appreciate a lesson. Hey, Stephen, thanks for asking the question, man. Great question. So reading. Um... I really recommend you do it every day to make a difference and make it sink in, you know, to your, actual, to your playing. You're going to have to be doing this every day. So what I recommend is just doing 10, 20, 30 minutes a day just on reading to make a difference. It's just like reading a book. In fact, I would say reading music is easier, but it's harder when you first, you know, when you first start because you're probably not doing it every day. Generally, the students that come to me, if they've been working on reading and I ask them, you know, how much are you working on your reading? They're kind of like, oh, once a week, you know. And it's so hard to make any, you know, real impact when you're doing it just once a week. So I'd just recommend doing it every day, even if it's for a tiny little bit. I'd also recommend books like, um, there's a book called Simplified Sight Reading for Bass. That's a great book. You could work with that, just looking at, you know, bits of that every day. Um, there's another book um, that something method chuck rainey did it it's book one of that i'm being a bit lame here i can't remember the name of it that's a good book but it's the book one something of other method chuck rainey did it and then for people that are really wanting to get into it the omni book bass clef edition um charlie parker omni book um, is really great if you really want to stretch out and do some uh, heavy sight reading that's great for that as well so thanks a lot Stephen, for the question rob asks hey scott i have cerebral palsy and have been playing bass since the age of 17. Because of my disability, I've had to learn to play left-handed bass, so I didn't really have a lot of speed or smoothness when I put the strings. Are there any techniques or exercises you can recommend for me to learn in order to compensate for the limitations of my left hand using my fretting hand, the right hand? Okay, Rob, so I get you. So you've, you're right-handed, but you've learned to play left-handed. And a few guitar players have um, done this. The late Gary Moore, he, played to, um, he learned to play 
He was left-handed and he played, learned to play right-handed. And there's a few bass players as well that have done the same thing. Now, what I'd recommend for you, if you're really wanting to um, make use of your fretting hand, is hammer-ons and pull-offs. You know, you can actually cover a lot more ground. Instead of playing something like, let's take a blues scale. You could, you know, slides and pull-offs, slides and hammer-ons. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six notes there, but I'm only playing one, two, three, four, but I'm playing one, two, three notes. So I'm playing three notes and getting all those notes from it. And what I'm doing is I'm playing, I'm plucking, plucking, hammer, slide, pluck, hammer on. And actually I use like hammer-ons and pull-offs all the time. If you heard me play stuff like, uh, you know, there's a ton of hammer-ons and pull-offs in there. So how you would practice this is just take a real simple scale. Let's take the C major scale. And you're gonna practice hammering on all the way up and then pulling off all the way down. So you play one note, you hammer on the next, okay? so. Pluck, hammer, pluck, hammer, hammer. So you're getting three notes for the price of one. Okay. And that's just ascending up the C major scale. And then when you're going down, you pull off. So I'm not lifting off here, because then you lose the you know, the intensity of the note, what I'm doing is pulling down like this. So you get. And even though that would seem like more of a solo line, but if I'm playing a groove like. I'm playing, I'm hammering these on, hammer, hammer, you know, pulling off more articulation, you can, you know, you can get more articulation from the, uh, from the left hand, and you know what, and this is a real cool thing to do as well, check out James Jameson, man, like, he played just with one finger on his right hand, and his lines are some of the craziest, busiest lines you've heard, you know, all the Motown stuff. Um, so I'd really maybe look at, because like the hammer ons and pull-offs are really great and you should definitely be using those or trying to work them into your playing. But you should also look at James Jameson because he just played with one finger on his plucking hand. I want to say right hand, but plucking hand, he played with one finger. And he got so much mileage out of that, you know, just playing with that one finger, that it may be be a really good idea to start transcribing some of his lines and trying to play, you know, get that vibe into your playing. Um, so you can kind of really get laser focused on he was uh, how he was doing it. And it's something I've done as well. I've been working on some left hand muting stuff where I'm just playing with one finger on the left hand. Um, let's take. Okay, now if I was to do that with just one finger on the right hand, now this is just totally off the cuff, so I'm struggling there with the right hand. But if I if I really practiced it, I'd get that so it's quite fluid. And that's so I'm just using one finger on the left hand and one finger on the right hand again. know try and sort of you know you can use them dead notes as well they sound great but yeah check out Jameson's stuff and work on them hammer-ons and pull-offs cheers for asking the question man Paul asks when are you going to get an Ampeg SVT 
Paul, I'd love an Ampeg for SVT. Honestly, like I've done a ton of gigs where they have hired in the, you know, the SVT's been hired in. And it's just when I turn up to a gig and that's been hired in for me, it's just a dream. It's just, I will see the stage, I see it, it's just an SVT there, you know, standing in all its glory, eight by 10 underneath it. You know, it couldn't be any better for me. So I want one, but you know, I don't know if it's gonna fit in my car. Laurie Miller asks, what is the brand of strings you use? Hey Laurie, thanks for asking a question. Um, the strings that I use on this bass, I use the Dario Chromes and they've been on for ages and I've got no intention of changing them because flat rounds, you can leave them on for ages and they just get more you know, cooler and more vintage sounding. On the other basses I use, again, I use the Dario strings um, and I use nickels, okay? So nickels and generally the light gauge. I use Didario because they're really um, consistent. I found, I've messed around with some string gauges. I should probably mess around a little bit more, but I found that some gauges, I mean, some string manufacturers are really inconsistent. So you'll buy a set and one of the strings will buzz weirdly or, you know, whatever. And Didario, uh, I've never had one like that actually. So they're the most consistent that I've ever played. So yeah, I use Didario. Franklin asks, I see guys slide into chords when they play and it's cool. I'd love to learn this technique and also chords that are applicable in different situations. Thanks. Hey Franklin, how are you doing? Thanks for asking a question. So sliding chords. Yeah, in fact, I was just ask, uh, just talking to Jeff about this the other day. Um, he mentioned that he'd seen me do it. And Jeff, by the way, is my right hand man, man in the uh, SBL Academy. Um, and actually, I should mention, we've just released this week a full chords course into the academy um, where I'm taking you through, well, everything to do with chords. So you should check out the SBL Academy if you haven't done already. Um, so chords and this sliding, if, let's take a blues. Essentially, you can play a chord on the bass or any instrument for, for this matter. Okay, and you can slide into it chromatically from either a fret above or a fret below. And that's all it is, okay? And it makes it sound really cool. So for instance, let's try a, a one. I'm gonna do it without slides, then I'll do it with slides, okay? One, a two, three, four. So it's just a C blues, right? Now with slides, you can just slide in either way. kind of overdoing it there but just sort of like to prove my point you can slide into chords all over the place so you can That's the question, man. Chris Churchill asks, I'm in the middle of learning a 35 song set list. Any tips on how to memorize the songs and structures? Great question, Chris. So when I'm learning, when I've got a lot of tunes to learn for a show, what I'll try and do is, you know, write them down initially in more of a long form format. So, you know, um, I'll write verse and then write the chords and, you know, so I could use them as crib sheet, what's called a crib sheet. So you've got it, you know, you can put it on the floor and, and keep checking it. And then from that initial kind of long form crib sheet, I'll try and kind of, you know, compress it into the least amount of possible, that I, and at least amount of information that I need to know to get through the gig. But here's the gag. Like if somebody calls me up and says, hey, we've got a gig, it's in three weeks time, and we've got 35 songs that you need to learn for it. I'm not going to sit there really and, you know, learn 35 songs off the bat and be able to memorize them like that. I'm going to use crib sheets. I'm going to be really open about that with whoever I'm working for. I'm going to be like, you know, I can't, you know, take two weeks out of my life and learn these 35 songs. Maybe if Prince calls, you know, 
Um, but a general call, I'm going to be like, you know what, I need to use crib sheets. Now you can use crib sheets in a really, in stealth, you know, just put them on the floor. And if they're cool with it as well, feel totally free to say, you know, I'm going to sort of like, you know, need to use crib sheets to start off with and to give myself a bit of a chance. Is it cool if I use a music stand and then put a light on it as well? So you can, you know, when all the, if, depending on what situations you're playing in, but it's cool to use a music stand with a light above it and your crib sheets on there, okay? So, and be totally open with them about that. I've had friends that haven't been open about it and they've got themselves into trouble. Essentially sort of, you know, you need to learn 30 songs, 35 songs in your case, um, in two weeks time, they haven't had the time to do it, and then, but they haven't been open about using crib sheets and the band leaders have been a bit, you know, you can't use crib sheets on this gig and, and that kind of thing. So it's really cool just to be open with them and say, you know, if you want me for the gig, I'm gonna to need to use crib sheets. I can't take two weeks out of my life just to sort of learn these, you know, learn these 35 songs, which is what it would take to do. So I'd really be open about using crib sheets and possibly, if they're cool with it, using a music stand with a light on as well. Obviously, it depends what type of band it is as well. As far as song structures is concerned, I'm the same as everybody. I just think, you know, intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, and that type of thing. And that really gets me by. And I also find as well, if you get yourself in a situation where you're learning a lot of songs like this, it's like any skill, the more you do it, the better you get. Um, I know guys, um, Lee Pomeroy comes to mind, who plays bass for Take That. Lee's an awesome dude. Um, and we were talking a few months ago and he, and he mentioned turning up to a gig and it was a full hour gig and he was listening to the, to the tunes in the car, on, on the way to the gig in the car. I think it was for the Sugar Babes or something. It was for, for like a heavy gig, you know. And, um, and he said he's just done it so much that he, it's, it's like this skill that he's built. He can just sort of like absorb tunes right off the go and just be able to sort of like pull them out, pull them out of the bag. So when you're going through these 35 songs, you know, it will get easier. And, you know, a few years down the line, it'll be really easy to sort of, you know, learn a big bulk of information like that and be able to sift through it super fast. Thanks for asking the question, ma'am. Matthew says, you rock, Scott. Matthew, you rock. Daniel asks, is there a way to practice chords and reharmonization on the bass? Hey Daniel, great question. And because I've just been doing, uh, well, we've just released a full chords course in the SBL Academy that you should check out. Um, it's, this has kind of been, you know, top of my mind recently over the last few weeks. So here's the deal. This is a massive question, right? And I could talk about it for a long time. But there's, there's a trick that I really like to use and it's something that I like to get my students to, to you know, to get into before they really even start thinking about chords and, you know, and inversions and all that type of thing. And I'm talking specifically about playing melody with chords, okay? Here's the cool bit. When you, when you first start looking into playing melody and reharmonization over a solo piece, let's take um, Days of Wine and Roses, for instance, okay? So the melody is... So the days of wine and roses, you know, it's like an old standard and standards are great to practice reharmonization over. What you should first start to do, and this is for anybody that wants to get into sort of like playing chords and reharmonization, is just learn a simple melody and then try and put the bass notes under the melody. This is loads harder than it actually looks initially. And I, I'm stealing this from Bill Frizzell actually. I watched a video on Bill Frizzell, great guitar player. You've got to check him out. Really, really just awesome vibe on the guitar and he was saying that it's just you can you can get so much mileage out of just playing the melody and the bass notes and then you can add some you know extra notes in uh, but you should really get this down first okay so for instance with that melody that I just played there let's look at that okay so the melody line the first chord's an F, okay? So, so I'm playing the melody line with my index. I play the bass note with my middle finger. And then we have a chord, a, the, move, the bass line moves down, but the melody line stays the same. So we've got, and then 
the melody line comes in again. And again, that's I'm playing the bass line there. So I'm playing the melody line and the bass line again. Now the next part of the melody. There again, melody at the bass line underneath the melody, and then the melody again. The bass line again. Melody. You know, so really just I'd, I'd really look at doing that. Um, as a way of just getting into it. So just think melody, and it could be any melody, you know. Um, oh. You know, try and play that melody and try and play the bass line underneath. Again, so Daisy Wine and Roses. Try, and, try that out, it's really cool. And you can do it with any melody. I'm trying to think of random melodies off the top of my head. Um, I did another one the other week in one of the bass hangs in the academy. Anyway, I can't remember. Anyway, guys, thanks so much for asking all the cool questions. Absolutely blown away by the response. Um, if you've got any questions for next week, you know, Ask Scott next week's show, just leave them in the comment box below this video. We'll go through them all, we'll pull 10 out, and then I'll ask them you know, I'll answer them, ask them, I'll answer them in next week's show. If you haven't signed up to the Scots Bass Lessons Christmas list yet, make sure you do so. There is a link beneath this video. And what we're doing is every day throughout December, we're doing a, a video, every day. <laughs> every day throughout the December, we're doing a video first to the 25th, so you're even gonna get one on Christmas day. It's gonna be good fun. Other than that, take it easy, and I'll see you in the shed.